that first, maybe before we start talking about the article, um, uh, first of all, thanks for everyone for coming today. Um, I was close, a little closer getting to Christmas, so it's nice you uh, found the time um and you're interested in reading the piece together um just a very quick thing um i hope you all got the email about uh the conference we're organizing the official invite the call for proposals yeah um so uh don't feel rushed at all as we said the the, the deadline for sending an abstract in um it's really just about a short abstract uh, 200 to 300 words um if you're interested in participating, the idea is obviously to invite everyone in the reading group that it's for you guys, if you're interested in it, uh, an opportunity to present your work uh, at a conference, um, there will be no fees. And it's the idea that it's a postgraduate early career researcher uh, conference. So we have speakers from New York coming, uh, quite a couple of famous ones, and hopefully it's going to be a really cool event where you can where you would have an opportunity to kind of share your research and get feedback and hopefully yeah um do some great networking um so if you're really interested uh, and you definitely know you would like to come um you can also drop uh, either me or mila or staff a private email then we can kind of put you on the list and know you're coming uh but that doesn't mean you have to rush the abstract the abstract is uh yeah in january or whenever we set the date um this is more for us that we can create the the program basically so that we can at one point um put the panels together and yeah send you guys a clearer program of uh who's presenting what but yeah if, if you if you think this sounds like a great idea and if you uh, uh if you know that you would like to participate then uh please um feel free to conduct us already and we can kind of put your name down basically um i know for example alad uh, would quite like to present but don't know about the rest just yet so um yeah, that was just to give an update. Um, anything else, Mila? No, I think it was more more that. Yeah, it was just that to know if you already know you are going to yeah to come or if you're not sure, it's okay. But yeah, <laughs> it's more that. Okay. Um. Yeah. So that was just a kind of first thing to say. So um. Yeah. Let's start maybe the reading group. Um. Steph chose a. Uh, great article i found it really inspirational so i've got a lot of cool ideas floating around here but uh, yeah uh, she came up with the idea so um maybe she's going to start saying a couple of things and then we can see what everyone else thought um i thought it was a great piece thank you yeah i will i think i'll just give a short introduction um you know and obviously i'm going to i'm going to repeat some of the things that uh, you probably read and hopefully i'll give a, a couple of pointers i think for interesting discussions um, so the article discusses um, connections and struggles across borders and more importantly it interrogates how migrant spaces and mobilization have shaped the memory of places and of one particular place on the Alpine border between Italy and France. Um, there is an obvious tension between local placemaking um, or maybe solidarity making and the attempt of erasure by states and institutions. Um, even though I, I found that maybe the article wasn't too, I mean, it, it's, it says that, you know, the, those memories and those solidarity practices are being erased. I, I think this could have been shown a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, but that's the argument that she makes at the beginning. So our question is, how is the memory uh, shaped by this tension between, you know, making a place, making something collective and erasing, um, you know, denying this, this kind of solidarity. Um, what I found interesting is that the solidarity and the support for migrants on the Alpine border, it, 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 she says that it has reduced the disassociation between citizens and non-citizens. And I thought that was a very interesting point, probably central, I think, to the article. And she says, she explains how the importance of the geographical context has in, impacted this kind of social response. So, you know, the, in this area, as people say, nobody can be left to die on the mountains. Um, so this social practice, you know, which is at, at the heart of these mobilization, they act in favors of those endangered by the mountains. And I think not, not necessarily migrants, um, and, and I thought that was also very interesting. And 
in this area, there's no difference between illegalized migrants and citizens because they are all united by the mountain. They're all united by survival, you know, the potential threat. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting. Um, one thing that I think we could discuss maybe is the approach uh, taken from the history from below, which kind of neglects the institutional point of view and, and focuses on the grassroots solidarity movement. And in that sense, I think she did the same uh, in her research. She kind of does research from below. She doesn't only look at policy and institutional practice. She looks at, you know, day-to-day -day normal citizens' um, movements uh, and ideas. And uh, I thought maybe methodologically uh, it made a lot of sense, I think. So I think she, she has kind of four sections, but I think I'll just focus on the, on the one and then I'll let you all speak, um, which is the Alpine migrant route. And <clears throat> I think what I found most interesting was this kind of connection with her territory. You know, the, the migrant route has been increasingly used after the hardening of controls, resulting in a shift from coast to the mountain. So, you know, I was thinking, even though she says, um, it's never been a deterrent for people to cross. It's still kind of moving people from a flat, urban, inhabited space to a rural, out of the way, and potentially uh, dangerous area. And I don't think we can claim that this is unintentional. I mean, it's also a policy choice, you know, to push people out in more dangerous places. And I think this control of migration and this control of borders across the world, it has been it has been made, it's an, an intention to make it perilous for illegalized migrants. Um, and the dangerous environment in a way is used as a, um, as a control tool, you know, and also as a scapegoat. Uh, it's not me, the state harming the migrants, it's the mountain, you know? So I, I don't know, I, I thought this was really interesting and uh, convincing. Um, and it, I think she says that the, the surveillance technology pushes migrants to, to go off marked paths and to cross in more dangerous conditions in the winter, for example. So again, I think that this question of intention is very interesting. Um, and I think this mobility as a form of resistance um, was an interesting idea. Again, I'm not entirely convinced uh, by the way she presented it. I think it could have been a little bit deeper. Um, but yeah, what I got from the article is how this solidarity is really inscribed and shaped by a particular geography, you know, by those people who live in the mountain and know, and know what it can do. Um, so hopefully, um, someone else wants to take over. Thank you. Um... Thanks, Steph. That was a great introduction. I've got a couple of notes here where I think that would connect to some ideas I would have as well. But maybe um, first see if there are, uh, if there are any other um, suggestions, ideas. What did you thought about the article? Um, is there anyone who wants to volunteer and go first? I really like to see first what people thought, and then we can maybe see what emerges as themes. Um, Adit just had his hand up. Yeah, I I agree. I agree with uh, what Steph said. It, it's um, it does kind of tell the story from the perspective of the actual geography and I thought it is interesting to learn about how different people have moved in different decades um, but I, I think it would have welcomed some kind of accounts of what actually happened to some of the people who got rescued it, it felt to me like that was a big question in my mind did they just get rescued for the moment and then I don't know they got caught some other time um, and maybe a bit more context about is, is it always between Italy and France and never the other way around? Um, and, but yeah, I think there's a lack of kind of completeness to the story, I felt, and sometimes it was, it dragged a bit. The, the, the introduction was really interesting and I definitely think it was good to use, you know, to reference Foucault um, and the stories from below. Definitely a good idea, but I'm not quite sure how it left me asking more questions about actually what happened happens there and what happened to those people. Yeah, uh, great stuff. Oh, so much connections, but I'll talk later. Um, Zara. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, I I really enjoyed this. I, I was interested in. I, I know we you know been talking about the geography of the place um, leading to sort of certain practices and and movements, but I I thought it was interesting with you know with the way she added the dimension of time that some of these things are, are kind of quite ephemeral and. Yeah. Uh, something about sort of sedimented knowledges of struggles over time as well as space kind of thing but she says something I found quite interesting that although it's sort of sedimented over time of all these other migrations that have happened over the mountains over time that sometimes it needs it's she says it's not solid ground it sometimes needs kind of reactivating I thought that was interesting that the history's there or genealogy as, as she um you know, talks about, but that it's not sort of continuous necessarily that things get reactivated. I thought that was interesting. And just one thing that immediately sprung to mind about the thing about the mountain rescue and that, you know, everybody was rescued for the mountains, whether you're a migrant or not. It, it what immediately sprung to mind for me was the recent thing about the um, RNLI. I don't know if everybody knows what that it's the, um, sea rescue volunteer um, <clears throat> service, although there are coast guards in, in the UK and in France that the channel crossings, a lot of migrants have been rescued by the RNLI, this voluntary organization who got into a lot of trouble actually by in some circles for rescuing migrants, but their whole thing is, is you know, they don't judge who it is their mission is to rescue people from the sea because it's like like the mountains it's the sea that that is the central thing and and they rescue anybody from the sea without judgment so it, it kind of made me th the mountain rescue thing made me think of the the sea rescue in in the channel that's that's uh, my contribution yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, I had a thought there too on how that relates and what I thought was actually quite interesting, how she turns this concept of politics and humanitarianism around. But again, I'll be happy to explain that later. Um, does anyone else have any any uh, thoughts about it? Um, Can I respond quickly to Sarah? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you're right. I didn't make the connection, Sarah, but you're absolutely right. I think it's exactly the same issue. And, and I think uh, Martina, in her piece, she talks about how those activist groups and the people supporting mountain rescue are being increasingly uh, criminalized. And I think the same thing happened with RNLI. The people who were openly supporting them were being accused of basically of supporting smugglers, of supporting, you know, all kinds of ridiculous things. So it it's interesting how those debates get kind of twisted um, and yeah po politicized into something much bigger than what they are which is saving lives um maybe i could say something there because i thought this was really interesting actually i found this kind of conceptually speaking one of the very interesting parts of the article that she turned something that sort of become commonplace in the critical migration literature slightly around. So we have this big literature, probably some of you know, since a long while that has criticized the concept of humanitarianism and the unequal politics at the heart of it, this idea of saving lives as uh, uh, so that, you know, like in border security, it has always gone hand in hand with securitization and occasionally saving migrants. Um, and uh, how in the literature for a long time, it was this sort of, uh, uh, yeah, the sort of acts of humanitarianism have been sort of criticized for being not political enough to say like, oh, we, you know, it's not about, uh, you know, we're no, no border, we're not no border activists. We are helping because they need help from a humanitarian perspective and how that has kind of for a long time got criticized by critical scholars for taking the politics out of it, the violent politics that drives people to cross borders and so on. And I found that quite fascinating that for kind of the first time I saw an article from that literature that actually turns it a little bit on its head, this kind of politics of humanitarianism and says, actually, you could also read it the other way around, that it really unsettles the divide between citizens and migrants, how Steph said, through this concept of the mountain, um, uh, that uh, anyone needs to be uh, rescued there. So 
instead of it being depoliticizing, it actually, um, yeah, has uh, a, maybe an, another underlying different dynamic of, yeah, uh, kind of breaking down boundaries between, you know, sort of, yeah, which always never straight boundaries, but like, yeah, breaking down boundaries between uh, migrants and citizens that the state discursively encourage us to think of. So, yeah, Alan? I just had a question. It says in, in the article about France suspending Schengen in 2015. Is that just for this geography? Because like I did um, I, I did the Camino de Santiago. We started in France and so we walked huh? through into Spain across a mountain. And, you know, that was easy. And, like, I've, I've crossed between France and lots of other countries and I've not noticed. Is it just this space that, that they've kind of that they patrol more than other places? Um, I, I can, yeah, Steph can answer uh, as well. Sorry, uh, because I was surprised as well leading, uh, reading about this Schengen thing. It, so it turns out that France has suspended Schengen in 2015 for a month, but there was a very kind of short action um, supposed to be, oh God, I don't, I don't even remember. It must have been really boring, <laughs> but... <laughs> But no, I think it was everywhere, but it was just a very short period of time. Yep. Well, to add there, yeah, that was uh, obviously the sort of long summer of migration or the refugee crisis of 2015. So a lot of states, Germany included, Schengen simply means that there's not supposed to be any border controls between any European states. And Austria, Germany, a range of other states uh, abolished Schengen for either shorter and have done a couple of times since then. So I think, for example, Denmark has never completely reintroduced Schengen again, specifically now in terms of Corona as well. Tons of countries have reintroduced controls on a momentary or longer basis. So this uh, this complete uh, uh, concept of Schengen as no border controls at all has kind of been non-existent since 2015 anymore. But yes, it's uh, the controls are obviously uh, incredibly narrow and often racialized because it's about uh, yeah preventing um, uh, certain forms of migration while leaving others. But um, yeah, uh, Katilia? Yes. Um, yes, it's about, you know, this uh, divide and settle between migrants and citizens. It's mm. because of the rescue everyone in the mountains. But also what I found really interesting in this um, case is that it's really a transit zone, like no one settled there. Mm -hmm. She writes that um, because in the migration literature, in many of uh, the so-called transit places now, migrants are locked, they settle, and, and here it's not the case, they never stay. She says um, that even... Um, they don't see them, they know about them only if they rescue them or if they found their dead bodies. And um, also what I found interesting is that uh, she said when the migrants changed, uh, only the French um, made more control on the border because they don't want the people to pass and the Italians uh, didn't. So I think this, um, this divide maybe is not that strange because um, there is no common life never, like, uh, they don't stay together. It's really just a punctual help and there's no conflict, but it's also based, uh, based on a more important divide, like people are settled and others are just on transit. And even if the migrants, um, like, change, uh, it's always like the, the same process. Uh, yeah, they don't stay. More than a rescue in the mountains, I find it's a transit that made this possible. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, you, Kadida. I thought that was a really good point and interesting. It kind of answers a little bit my question. I thought maybe I can put that back to the group what you thought, um, because it has been popping up. And what I thought was almost a little bit under theorized because it keeps coming back up this kind of, or I would have, I, I know there's limitations to an article in terms of road count and so on, but. What she keeps coming back to is this kind of, uh, she, she has different terms from it. What, what one was called uh, the mountain humanitarian duty, the mountain principle, and it's like no one is left to, uh, supposed to be left to die on the mountain. And um, there is a bit of a genealogy there, but it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I would have liked to know a little bit more 
where does it come from and where i mean yes it is a humanitarian principle per se but um uh yeah from that relates also to what zara said i was like hmm that it's interesting that there is this specific very particular geography there where there seems to be on both sides this kind of that yeah through that geography there is a certain solidarity then and i was like hmm, the, because we have other geographical contexts like the mediterranean which is uh, effectively a mass grave for you know like other cross like the channel now um we are uh, again as sarah pointed out really really rightly because i thought of like example two the all and i exactly use the same uh uh argument to say uh anyone in sea gets rescued um so that there's interesting particular geographies where there is a certain notion around that but i was like yeah what 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 does what makes this mountain special compared to the mediterranean for example um felix hi sage yeah thank you um i'm really agreeing with all what you said all of us and about this idea of why mountains are, are um, um, specific geographical place where where they where, where some solidarities are created, and I was always uh, also thinking of during when I was reading the article that she that Martina um, could have spoken about um, also the opposition movement of these solidarities movements. For example, in the um, Alpine border, there were like um, uh, nationalist and identity groups who, who were there for like um, stopping the migrants coming from Italy. And like, I think the mountain also crystallized, crystallized this idea of like a natural border of like yeah. the natural French space. And mm -hmm. Like uh, um, uh, like you said, like the article is quite short, and he, he was not able to speak about um, all, all these aspects. But speaking also about this idea that uh, mountains and um, mediticization of these uh, migrant routes can also um, crystallize this idea of like protecting the national space and where mountains look a, um, a bit more like natural borders and. Uh, sometimes borders more like easy access than the mm. a, a sea border or something like that. Mm. Yeah, that is a really good point on the mythology of it as well as as a national space and a natural border. That would be the kind of opposite to what she uh, sort of uses it there as well. But um, yeah, I just yeah, absolutely, You're completely right. Um, I don't know what everyone else thinks about that. I've thought it was fascinating that uh, this particularity of the kind of French Italian space and I was trying to think of what makes this how how do these solidarity things turn up there how does it compare to the Mediterranean for example or more current examples the English Channel or the Polish Belarus border uh, what makes those uh, crossings different uh, than the mountain Um, oh yeah, Felix. I think the the mountain geographical space, like the, could create more like an identity, like local identity. And I think, like I, I knew a bit this region, and I think these ideas of solidarities are more from local people who live mm -hmm. in these mountain areas, whether than these uh, nationalist movements are more from people from more like not like from people who which not are uh which were not born in this place it's mm. like i think the local people who live there are more like the this in the side of this solidarity uh movement mm. and and this is like i i think it's like a global i mountain identity or something like that but because it's a a dangerous place, um, dangerous space. People know that we have to help each other. Mm. Well, and I think this is the opposition between local population and more like national population. We don't share the same uh, idea of the, the mountain. Mm. I, I wonder also, I, I went to the um, the Tyrol a few years ago, kind of the north of Italy and how it 
linked into Austria and that was definitely a space where there was lots of uh, mixed culture between and, and language between Italy and German and yeah German, uh, Germanic um, things like food and alcohol and stuff it's a great place to visit as a tourist but you could also just see the evidence of, of fighting in World War One, World War Two, and the kind of backwards and forwards. And maybe also, I don't. I've only crossed between France and Italy once, so and I was quite young, so I can't really remember what that space is like. But maybe it's also a space that hasn't had so many people living in it. I'd be interested to know more about that specific job. And that's actually one of the things that the article. Maybe if there'd been some photos or a map that can help to tell the story a bit better and maybe um, it did talk about people coming from Yugoslavia as was uh, through to Europe through this route so a bit of context about why maybe other alpine routes weren't chosen could be interesting as well. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, yeah, I thought so too. There were sort of uh, different elements there as well to what you just said, Alad, about, uh, you know, she does this genealogy of different groups of migrant groups and has a couple of, again, uh, I think conceptually, she always hits up really, really interesting things. For example, this idea of uh, disturbing, again, the migrant citizens of I to show how some Italian workers were illegalized um, so that uh, you can be made a migrant by the state quite quickly. But still, there was a I think for the purpose of her paper, she wants to show that there's a collective memory of rescue. So um, she kind of talks about these uh, histories of people on the mountain being rescued. And I kind of wondered, but again, you know, like uh, uh, article limitations, I guess, but uh, if there would have been sort of differences, you know, hierarchizations of migrants, how, you know, was there sort of uh, the way she portrays it, and maybe that is that way, but it was a bit hard for an outside reader to tell us that a general sort of established local culture of helping everyone on the mountain or has that is that maybe not that clear cut was there maybe uh let's say more help for migrants 30 40 years ago when there was you know europeanized right migrants on or there are sort of racial hierarchies or something like this that's i felt was would have been something interesting to at least you know mention in passing or maybe you know um maybe does not um but uh yeah, I think the purpose of her paper is to kind of, uh, yeah, un turn that around, that this politics of humanitarian sort of unsettles migrants and citizens. So it's about rescue. Yeah, and no one is left to die on the mountain. But again, it's something I mentioned before. I don't know what people think. I, I really found it fast, this principle. I was fascinated. I would have liked a little bit more history of where that comes from, from that context. What, you know, why can't people die on the mountain? As bad as that sounds, but, you know, where, where does it come from? Why is that so locally ingrained? Um, Felix? Yeah, just to add that, I don't know the Italian side, but in the French side, like, this idea of, like, no one should die in the mountain is, is shared with people who already have, like, a political... Um, uh, positionality or about this question of solidarity and migrations and stuff. And in this region in, in France, like in near Briançon, um, there are also um, um, a big part of the population who don't share these ideas. Mm -hmm. Like uh, these departments are also um, rural and they are they are like a high rates of. Uh, nationalist uh, uh, political, uh, like during elections, like the nationalist party got uh, high, 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 vo high votes, like a, uh, yeah. a big number of votes. So, so I think we shouldn't think that in this region everyone shared this idea of like no one should die in the mountain. It's, uh, I think it's more like a legacy of some some social groups, or but it's not like a general thing there. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah, got something uh, to add? Yeah, I was just um, thinking again about what Khadija said that that about it being, um, you know, people are rescued, but they don't settle there. And what would it be like? You know, everything might be really different if if 
after you know when, when you've rescued somebody then your responsibility is kind of goes you know you don't have to um think about it anymore kind of thing and, and how different it would be if people were rescued on the mountain but then you know you had to kind of hold that and do something with it that it, it would be kind of that in those, in those communities it would be really different and opposition might be you know you, as, as um, Felix has said there there is opposition but you know that opposition might be stronger we don't we don't know so it's kind of very particular in that way as well isn't it compared with people who are moving across the border and then settling where they are um yeah yeah absolutely um does anyone want to add there because i would have otherwise have an idea that maybe could contribute there uh Khadija? uh yeah it's about what you said about the hierarchy like if there is a hierarchy in the health like uh, in the history that's what you said right yeah but what I find interesting too is that um, the the history of the like the people who migrate they change, but at the time they migrate they are the illegals. So the it follows the um, the borders. I mean it's like I think Stephanie said um, it's a, a control by the state. Like you close the easy way and then. Um, like the dangerousness is like a kind of control. And I think there is, okay, maybe there's not that much a hierarchy because all the migrants, when they migrated in that road, they were the illegals. Um, because the borders changes, changed with the time. Yeah, just, just that. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I didn't thought of that. Yet, but it's true. At least in so, at least in current circumstances, that um, the by definition you would accept you're someone hiking for the fun of it. If you take that route, you are probably have been illegalized because otherwise you would not take such a dangerous path. Um, so it already it's also the mountain, the kind of the physical geography, in addition to the state, enforces the status already onto you. You're by by taking this route assumed to be illegal. Um, it, it would also uh, be interesting to um, sort of explore what would make the people of that place turn and change their change their values and attitudes. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, this is like in a British context, but um, one of the things that happened in the last few years was the way that, you know, this kind of red wall idea of places that would never vote for the Conservative Party it's kind of linked to um, trade unions in the past and linked to the miners' strike in the 1980s. And I came across this concept called social haunting, which is basically about how places are um, affected by something significant which happened in, in the past. And that mm. gets passed on to future generations. And then at a certain time, they will question whether that still works for them in the present moment. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, you don't have to be haunted by something bad. You can also be affected by something which is a, a more positive feeling. Mm -hmm. it, and, and it could be that there's an inverse situation happening here in, in this place that people have felt a bit like people who will rescue, you know, go out to see that that's what, that's what makes certain places feel positive about themselves. I worked in a, a town in South Wales where they have a RNLI lifeboat and it's just really powerful in, in the psyche of those people. And, you know, every now and again, they have to rescue somebody who's done something stupid, but it's still, you know, like they, but they still feel very strongly about that and it's part of their identity. So, but then it's a question of how long this stays part of the identity and, and whether this can be challenged or eroded mm -hmm. over time. And who is worth saving? But uh, this uh, social hunting uh, is a great concept. Let's maybe get back to that. Um, Jola uh, had uh, his hand up. He wanted to say something. So um, maybe we can return to that concept later also, because I'm quite interested in it. But uh, Jola? 
Um, Sergio, I think you're on mute still. So if you unmute yourself, we can hear you. Okay. I don't want to come back about um, your latest questions. Um, to you want to know how, why uh, they said no one should like to, should let die uh, in the mountain, and I think this question is related to the memory. I think because the, the nations of memory is, uh, of the crushing during the Second World War is uh, also interesting and has greatly influenced solidarity there because. Because it is a place of memory that constitutes a reference of uh, solidarity action. When she started the paper, she said that uh, she, I think she take a piece of interview she collect from her her field, and that person was was saying that the, this mountain is a memory place because people use people who were persecuted in the Second World by by fascists was fleeing Italy through this place and people consider like that migrants are also fle fleeing something maybe uh, difficult the, the, uh, I don't know difficult uh, maybe problems or in the maybe war maybe something like this in their country and they need help like all these people who were fleeing uh, Italy, uh, national party persecution. Then I think the question here is how does the memory influence the action of the solidarity in, in this case? That's, I think that is the main question we must ask ourselves. Uh, I think that's what I want, I just want to say. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, that was a great contribution. I saw that as well on this sedimentation she talks about. Uh, maybe as well something we could get back to. I thought it was interesting. Something that's not solid yet going beyond the temporal. Um, Felix? Yeah, just to add that, I think this idea of like a memory of migration in this region could have been, um, could have been analyzed more, more in the past too, because there were like other others um, moment in history where people were like refugeeing in the mountains. Like for example, I know that there is a village there which were constituted by uh, Protestants fleeing the the, the Protestant um, persecutions. I don't remember the, the the century, but it was like more like before the nineteenth century. And also wanted to add in this idea of like solidarity in the mountains that I think it's also um, older than the migration idea. It's like, for example, in the mountain, there is, there are, there is this idea that uh, in the um, refuge in the mountains, like the, the small houses in the mountains, everyone, like it's a, a collective space and everyone should like respect this idea. For example, I know that when you go there, you have to uh, bring your food and then let some food for the next person who will arrive. So I think this idea of solidarity could exist, could yeah, could exist like before the idea of like migration solidarity. It's like more like uh, in front of the idea that mountain is a dangerous space and we should help like all the people who will cross the, the mountain. So I don't know, but I think it could be possible like to split, like to separate this idea of solidarity uh, in front of the migration, um, migra uh, like yeah, to, to separate this idea of solidarity between mountain and migration. And I think mm. like this idea could have existed before the um, migrations issues. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um... Does uh, anyone con want to contribute to that, this idea of uh, solidarity a bit more? I think that is quite something we've uh, um, not sort of put so much at, considering it's a term she uses a lot yet. And um, I found that quite, uh, yeah, interesting that, uh, so because 
Hills is kind of looking at the politics, the potential progressive politics at the heart of humanitarianism. Again, as I said before, which I find fascinating because the literature tendency wise has been on deconstructing the very concept of humanitarianism uh, over the last 10 years. And she's almost saying like, look, this actually can, you know, uh, trouble the boundaries we draw between migrants and citizens. But um, in terms of solidarity, I sometimes wonder if that's quite the right terminology. If the, if the logic of the mountain, this mountain principle is we save anyone, yes, it, it establishes it, but it's also then not problematizing why some people go over the mountain or not, right? Like, it's like we're saving them because they're crossing the mountain, but that's it. So this is the humanitarian principle kind of thing. It doesn't ask further, why are people risking their lives on the mountain? Um, and the question is as well, solidarity. I wonder, um, there are some things I found interesting she mentions at the end, but doesn't really explore further this kind of very current criminalization of solidarity, of help. Um, so, which makes it again, uh, uh, political, but in, um, yeah, it's. A, I wonder if you could read that differently as well. If it's like people helping on the mountain, sort of, you know, assisting migrants, um, that it's as well. It's kind of acting on behalf of someone. Is is solidarity quite the right term, or is there maybe as well, a, you know, problematic politics involved there? Of, um, yeah, that's sometimes I wonder. Solidarity for me, there's always. Uh, but again, maybe this is my simplified conceptualization of it. But solidarity, there is a kind of groups of equal power, so to speak, that can solidarize. Well, I'm not sure that's quite the case here. Um, but again, that was just something um, I sort of, I know, Sergey, you put something on the chat on solidarity. Um, maybe you have an idea on that or something. No, no, no. That's very interesting. Thanks a lot. Uh, sorry, I joined the discussion later. Um, to me, there are kind of three things which I take from this paper. One is that you took this discussion about materiality. You talked about different kinds of materialities involved. You know, it was really interesting to hear everyone speaking about uh, the physicality of the mountain, um, you know, the kind of the particular context which produce some sort of arrangements between different people. And I'm thinking about this sort of affective materialities, the sense of um, intangible uh, prompts which forces which kind of encourage people to respond to suffering or to um, other people in trouble. Mm. Second thing which really was interesting for me is that sense of um, sense of uh, temporality here and discussed in kind of in a particular term that these things are very fleeting and again it speaks to the idea of effect which is really um, unstable something which doesn't necessarily linger on something doesn't stay in one particular place for too long it is a very momentary coming together of different things. So uh, Martina speaks about uh, De Genova, I think, in terms of, you know, for this kind of arrangements of different actors. So really different sense in which we kind of speak about migration or history, which is, which is, doesn't have a solid thing. And the third thing which I was really interested in is this idea of solidarity. I started to put it in the chat um, because you seem to be, again, from what I'm picking in discussion is that you're talking about in collective terms, so the kind of the sense of collectivity. But we tend to think about collective as a, as a group of people, I don't know, whatever. Uh, we, we, we speak about it in terms of, um, as a very human, humanistic action. But I'm wondering whether the collective here, it can be understood in, in, in a broader term. So people like uh, uh, Félix Guattari, a French philosopher, talks about uh, collective as something which is beyond an individual, something which sort of comes together and creates this particular connection something which kind of acts um, at the level of the socialist. I'll put a quote here if you want, um, which uh, may be helpful. Um, so it kind of a, a very different sense of collectivity, um, which we perhaps are not, we, we kind of tend to consider it in terms of, as I say again, human driven action. Um, well here, if we bring together all those other things, materiality and intangible materiality of mountains, whatever it is, um, uh, affects and and these kind of collective forces who might arrive at a very different conclusion. Mm. So I, I'm really curious and 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 to me the approach which Martina uses here, genealogical approach, is 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 disruptive. I like the fact that she uses Foucault in this in this in these terms. Disrupts history, opens up other possibilities, 
And maybe that's enough prompt for us to think about these collectivities and solidarities, not as a kind of humanistic action, you know, not as something which is driven by humanistic principles, because effectively it involves non-human forces. But that's a question I want to ask everyone rather than, you know, try to establish it. So that was my kind of reflection. Um, thank you very much. That kind of connects back to the paper we discussed a few weeks ago in terms of the non-human side of things. And I've been looking at Google Maps to actually see where this place is. And uh, there are some ski resorts on the Italian side of the border, uh, but it's it's a big, long border. And yeah, so maybe there is something, maybe, you know, the actual space itself has got some generosity in terms of allowing people to cross. And one of the things that said in the article as well was about how um, there's like a logic that this was such a crazy place to cross that the French authorities wouldn't actually be there in the winter time when it was really hot. But <laughs> in fact, they are there. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, I mean, the, the whole kind of assemblage idea of how there are these things which these, ways of being that that belong in certain spaces is 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 definitely worth exploring a bit further i think as i think sergey was suggesting um yeah absolutely i would agree i think it's uh it would make a perfect paper to kind of jump onto the you know uh, something else related to this uh yeah which is i guess the newest trend is the more than human uh, approaches, um, kind of new materialism and uh, what I was called. I think philosophically speaking, this would make a very interesting case of, you know, what we've been discussing, the practical physical geography of um, how that plays into the scenario. Um, yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, we have, uh, trying to think, we had solidarity now. Um, uh, humanitarian duty. Uh, something I found interesting. I don't know if I would. I don't know if people kind of jumped onto that. Was this idea of she mentions it at the beginning, but then um, I think it's more of a concept she uses of how because she tries to bring two things together, right? This like idea of memory and uh, the temporal element of migrant struggles. What uh, what Sergei said as well. That's that they are so fleeting. That they disappear, that they uh, that are so momentary, and uh, I think what she's trying to do is to, uh, I think she says this somewhere as well, to kind of challenge this exclusive analytical grid of this temporality to say this is also a uh, can also sediment in memories. Um, so she uses specifically, I just found the term very interesting, sediments, um, because a sediment is something that's sort of stable but not. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I haven't really thought it any further through, but I thought that was a really interesting concept of like, um, but she doesn't really go further into it. I know I'm maybe throwing something very complicated out there, but yeah, this idea of like, okay, so what is this process of sedimentation? So we have these really, really under the, under the visibility struggles that are, uh, as Steph actually pointed out, often, and she draws not at all on that, which is probably for the purpose of the paper, okay, but she kind of completely misses out how states actively erase memories of these struggles too. Um, but yeah, we have this example of struggles that should really be or are under the radar, but yet they somehow sedimented. Um, so this kind of process of how, why do they become memory and how they get they reactivated. Um, does anyone... Has any uh, any thoughts on that, on memory, maybe? To, to go maybe to that concept of memory a bit more. Um, Felix? Yeah, I, I think this idea of like a memory of struggles mm -hmm. could also be shared by the local population without this idea of migration. It's like, okay. I think like, I don't have any references, like some scientific references, but I think that People who live in the mountain, like I, I, the thing is, like this region, I I know a bit this region because I have many friends and I spend a um, lot of time there, and I found that everyone knows like stories of struggles in the mountains for like um, weather, like cl climate uh, disasters, or like individual uh, accidents, and so I think this 
memory of, of struggles uh, like could be shared by the local population. And then when they see that migrants are like crossing these mountains, they, they can assimilate the risk to those populations too. So um, I think these this memories of struggles are linked with the like the local population memories struggles, the um, historical memories like with the World War II and with others even like that, like more like historical, like um, official histories. And then also with the, all this idea of like migrant struggles and the three aspects could um, produce different levels of struggle memories and then they could intersect in local places or with local social groups and over time too. Like, I think it's, I think the, the, ge the geographical space is, is the, the main um, um, factors or uh, producers of those struggles memories. Yeah, I, I really like that. I, I, I agree. And I think also that it's maybe people who live there just realise that life is precarious and difficult. Yeah, and yeah. that they've got more empathy for when other people have lived in like a really hard situation and they have to move because, you know, places where maybe your house, you have to move your house because it gets destroyed by, I don't know, the the snow or the wind or something so you always you maybe people who live in these places recognize more the the strength of what nature can do and the now the mountain represents that kind of ever present and then the snow and all the other things that happen whereas if you live in like a more boring place maybe then you can't quite you know where everything is close by and you just spend money rather than having to spend your own energy and your own emotions, then you, you know, it helps. Maybe people just understand a, a lot better that how, how hard life can be and how physical, the physicality of life as well. And, and I think also there is like a memory of death in those regions. And I think like people who live there, they, they enjoy the mountain, like, those who practice the mountain and then it's more like a personal choice choice to like risk his own life for like enjoying the, the mountain whether than when it is like people who don't have these mountain identities and they are forced to pass to pass through those those paths i think it could produce like more empathy like you say like i think that I choose to live there and I know the risk, but I live with that. And, and then those people who just like are uh, forced to pass through the mountains, I think it could produ produce yeah, uh, um, this necess necessity of helping others that could have less tools for like uh, living in the mountains or people who are like more... Yeah. People who and, are not this region. Maybe there's a thing about if your family's lived there for hundreds of years, then did you choose it? Did you choose yeah, yeah. it or did that place choose you? Mm -hmm. And you know, mm -hmm. I've got friends who've got like from a farming background and their families lived there for many hundreds of years. And it's kind of, it's a hard place to live, but they feel connected to it. Yeah. The reasons they, they can't really explain that they're, they're kind of more bonded. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Line. Yeah. Like, yeah, and I think that's um, also the common point with uh, rescue in the sea. Like it's kind of places, if you are there, like for the people who live there or who are used to go through the sea, I think it's the same. Uh, solidarity is necessary to the survival. So it exists with or without migration. And then it's a principle. Because, uh, yeah, like same as what you said for the mountains. Common point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Sarah? You want to I, this just, I don't know why this just suddenly sp sprung to mind from something that Al had said about you'd look, he'd looked on the map and there were sort of ski resorts and things and how kind of, I don't know, I, I, it's how sort of weird it is that 
that as well it's the same space that we've been talking about as sort of dangerous and this and that is also used recreationally at, and that those two things are happening kind of at the same time um i don't know it just sort of struck me as a weird thing that those you know there's the danger but there's all this also people going there for fun and recreation but i don't know what where that's going but i just <laughs> throwing it out there no i think you're completely right that's a very good point i think there have been yeah i guess the mediterranean once again relates there too it's uh, uh, yeah, the yeah Europe speech, while it is also um, a mass grave, effectively, and uh, sometimes very momentarily, you even have these pictures from Spain when migrants arrive on the beaches while the tourists stand there and stare, um, which makes there's a I think there's a lot of interesting conceptualization of that. This kind of yeah, I guess people can't take the obscenity of it <laughs> when it's so directly captured in a picture. Um, but uh, it, yeah, interesting. I didn't know that uh, because she doesn't describe an article. I haven't looked on it at the map, but uh, there's ski resorts there. Um, yeah. Um, and and it's a wealthy region, like Briançon, in the, like in the Italian side, I don't know, but in the French side, I know that it's a wealthy region. And like, there is like a, like I think there is a lot of inequalities, like in economic inequalities too. Okay. Yeah, I thought that would be something interesting to maybe look up. Uh, sorry, that's uh, Steph. Uh, you can go next on Felix. What you said is on the on the politics of it. Uh, like, uh, I would be quite interested what are sort of the slightly more electoral politics of the places, like the villages, because uh, because in France specifically, you still have you know like um, you're really nationalist, or is it really communist? Is it you know like uh, or something in between? Is that you know would that play a role? Is there a kind of political history, how you said it's like memories of struggle as well, because um, would that play into it? That was a little bit, I think, underexplored on, because um, as well, because she focuses the article quite on these like two villages on the Italian side or one on the Italian, one on the French side, and it would have been quite uh, interesting to maybe add something there. Um, I think... Oh, sorry. No, no, Felix, no. First and then no. Sam. I feel like if, it, if it's directly related, you answer, I'll speak after. Yeah, uh, uh, just to say that I think the um, like Martina Tazzioli was more like uh, I think the the field work was not uh, equally split between France and and mm -hmm. Italy. I think she works more on the Italian side, but yeah, I think this idea of um, looking out. Like because all the article was focused on the solidarity, like the for me it was like really positive also about all this idea of solidarity in the local population uh, in the mountains, and I think yeah, like it could be interesting, like working about the resistance or like the uh, anti movements, anti immigration movements there. Uh, and I think it could also, it could also um, explain why migrants don't stay there when they arrive in this region. I think it's well, it's also a rural region, so about like w uh, jobs, uh, opportunities, and stuff. It's not really really interesting for migrants. But I think it like this this resistance, local resistance to migrations, could also uh, explain in a way this this process that migrants don't stay there. Yeah, that's a good point. Steph, you wanna go? Yeah, I may be a bit late now to join <laughs> on, on uh, but I briefly looked because I was interested, you know, you're right. Is there, um, um, is there a connection between, you know, solidarity practices and the politics of one region? So actually very recently that region in the Alps, um, turned conservative after a decade of being a labor. Um, so, you know, I think this just kind of pervasion of populism everywhere is just showing even if even in those places. So I, I wonder if we're gonna see a shift in the next few months or years, you know, about is it gonna be more um, criminalized, you know, to be an activist yeah. to save people? I think that will be an interesting Thing. Um, and just to jump on what Sarah said, um, in the article she mentions a, a documentary 
um, um, a short film, no, a documentary, I think. So I, I try to find it, but there's no free screening online, but you can see the trailer. And yeah, you, can, you can really see that contradiction, you know, between people, you know, wealthy white people skiing down the mountains and then, you know, not so privileged, uh, not white migrants uh, at night, you know, being in the same mountains and being in a completely different uh, position. So, yeah, probably a nice, very nice documentary to watch this kind of tension between what the mountain does to different kinds of people. Yeah, um, absolutely right. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump on that. That's maybe a good last word as well. I thought um, in in the sense that uh, I thought as well, because she finishes the article and then again, you know, there's limitations to the size of an article, what she's trying to do. But it's interesting that at the end, she kind of not leaves it open, but she ends it with that we have a history lately. I think this has specifically been since 2015 that these acts of humanitarianism are increasingly criminalized. So she uses the example of four people that are being taken to court right now for helping in the mountain and so on. So this kind of history we have here, how long will that prevail? And um, uh, I don't know if it's in the channel so much because this is a comparatively new phenomenon, but definitely in the Mediterranean. So obviously these private initiatives, there's a couple from Germany who does it. They have these private trips. They are, I mean, they are now the German state tries to on get to get them on technicalities. The Italian state basically arrests them on a regular basis, like basically keeping people from drowning is effectively criminalized nowadays. You And it's, uh, as well, that makes these acts that used to be comparatively safe to do as a form of activism increasingly dangerous. I mean, you're facing now serious, serious prison time if you do that. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of what, where will these, um, how can we keep sort of these, yeah, collective memories of struggle or of, of humanitarianism of, let's say in this example, the mountain principle and how can that prevail, hopefully. Um, there was such, a, such an optimist um, ending to this. <laughs> <laughs> we can end on a negative note as well if someone wants to add something, I don't care. <laughs> but, no, no, um, that was sarcastic. I think that was totally pessimistic what you said, but totally, totally true, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. For, <laughs> For an optimi optimistic point, uh, <laughs> more in the um, southern Alpine border between Italy and France, there were like uh, activism, like uh, activists, people who were like um, helping migrants. And I think like two years ago, it was like, it were like um, um, juridic, um, juridic pursuits. Mm -hmm. And like, I think like two months ago, he, he won the, um, the trial and he was not criminal, like, criminalized for like helping migrants like that. I don't know all these details of this story, but and, and this, this, this man had like a um, huge visibility in, in like um, media uh, spheres and, and stuff. So I think it, the, those kinds of histories of or actions could also uh, increase this idea of solidarity in, in, in those regions or also in other regions. So it's, it's for an optimistic point. Thank you, Felix. Okay. We, needed, <laughs> we needed the happy Christmas. Yes. Note. <laughs> <laughs> the cheerier ending. Um, yeah, thank you, Felix. Um, all right. Uh, does anyone has any really, really last thoughts they definitely want to get uh, out there um, from the deepest uh, corners of the art? No. Great. Um, no, I thought, uh, thank you guys all for coming. I thought it was a really great reading group today. I think we covered a lot of very interesting things and um, I was most certainly getting new ideas about it. And yeah, I sort of got a new theme for myself. Yeah, this idea of how solidarity is created through the physical geography and how that can be used and kind of be further conceptualized. Uh, almost got an interesting research agenda there for critical migration studies. Um, so that is a very good thing. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, I think... Uh, so Mila and Steph, I think we're going to send, so obviously now Christmas is coming up soon and so on, but we're going to have our next reading group in uh, January at one point. Um, so we're going to send you an email 
think by Friday or Monday, we'll see how fast we get to it. But um, uh, again, like last time, if if you have anything you think would really fit the reading group, anything that's kind of current in migration studies or an article you came across, so you think, wow, this is a really cool piece, I'd like to discuss it. Uh, please feel free to uh, send us an email with a suggestion and we're happy to consider it and see if we can uh, integrate it. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, tell yeah. us what you want to read. And and I mean, maybe we, we can expand a little bit if it's about mobility or, you know, if it's something that's not quite exactly, but kind of fits within what we've, you know, said, or it's just an interesting piece. Yeah, please share. Brilliant. Sorry for jumping in. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone, then. And... Um, I thank think we see other than, yeah. No, I'll just great. say thank you for organizing it. And oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.